So may we never fail to speak of the reason for our hope. May we never fail to speak of our need for Christ. And I believe there are open opportunities before us all the time. And again, it might not look like standing before an angry, violent mob, but it may simply be the conversations that we are invited into. As someone just asks a question, see something different in us. How do you have the hope that you have in a world that is so filled with fear? We, we live in an incredible place. Um, and, and I think if you've traveled anywhere across the globe, um, I always have this moment where if I've, I've gone somewhere, when I get back onto U.S. soil, there's something about it. It's like, okay, I'm here. Um, there's freedoms that we're afforded. There's things that we have. Um, it's incredible. It's also, as we've seen over this last year, uh, there's a lot of division in our country, and we have the freedom to express opinions and divide. We also have the freedom to gather in this space and to proclaim the truth of who Jesus is. And so um, I just, I just want to take a moment and just pray uh, for our nation, for, for our leaders, for our country. And ultimately, um, we're going to see that Paul takes his citizenship uh, very seriously, um, but he also has it rightly ordered. And that he's always a kingdom of heaven first and foremost, but he also loves where he's from and the citizenships and the rights that come within that. And so I just want to pray for our country that those who are here and far from Jesus would come to know him as king. So if you just bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, we are grateful uh, and we do acknowledge on this day um, just the, the gift it is to be a part of our country. Lord, the the freedoms that we have here, that we can even uh, gather in a space, we can proclaim your name. We're not wondering who's coming, who's watching, who's doing what, Father. Um, We don't take that for granted. Uh, And Lord, I do pray for uh, the leaders, uh, every level in our nation, from uh, president down to mayor, God, would you just uh, give your wisdom. Lord, would they never rely on their own? And those who do not know you, God, we pray ultimately that they would come to know you, that they would come to know what it means to follow you, what it means to to bow our knee to you. Uh, Jesus, you are sovereign over all things. There's nothing outside of your control. You are king. You are the true king over all things. And, And we pray that in our nation, Uh, that people would turn to you, that there would be revival that starts, Father, and may it start with us uh, in proclaiming who you are. May it grow in our communities. May it grow beyond the borders of this state, Father, across our nation as people turn towards you and find hope in you. And so as we uh, take time to celebrate today and remember the uh, the cost of many of the freedoms that we have, um, Lord, would we... um, would we find ourselves with a heart of gratitude? Um, but God, would we also uh, never back off of, of pushing towards your rule and your reign, uh, towards living out your kingdom values here and now? Um, and so, Jesus, we give you all glory this morning. We love you, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. 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 This morning, we are going to continue in our study Acts, and I'm going to invite my friend Fred to come on up and read for us. <laughs> I, I like that. Fred. <laughs> Wait a little. Uh, if you would stand. Hey. We're going to be reading Acts 22, 1 through 21. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that, he was addressing them in the Hebrew language. They became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are here this day. I persecuted this way to the death binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear witness. From them, I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way near to draw to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. 
and I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one, Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteousness, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be witness for him to everyone of, uh, to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon his name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of the Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue and another I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of, the, of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself, standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Thank you. You may be seated. Thanks, Fred. It's funny. Is Fred, Fred happened to be our reader today, but I... Whenever I imagine the scene with uh, Ananias, and he says, Brother Saul, I almost hear your voice. Because you always say, Brother, and I, and I love it. So you, you're my Ananias. So thank you, Brother Fred. Um, well, there's a, there's a story uh, that Donald Whitney tells um, in his book, the, the Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. And, and the story begins by a, a man who lived in the Pacific Northwest, and after years of, of being around Christians and seeing Christians, he's, there's kind of this movement that was happening, uh, and, and he came to know the Lord, and he was so excited that he began to share this with everyone that he could, and he went in and he began to talk with his boss uh, and tell his boss of the transformation that had taken place in his life, and he said, I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus now, and I, wa I want you to know that. And his boss looked at him and so excited, he said, I'm a Christian too, and I've been praying for you for years. And it was at this moment that the man's countenance changed completely and actually became very sad. And he looked at his boss and he said, why, why didn't you ever tell me? Why didn't you ever share this with me? And when I hear that story, what, what's frightening to me, also encouraging to me, is I, as I see myself in both sides. The opportunities that were probably presented along the way that this boss just missed and never really fully stepped into, those open moments and conversation and dialogue that he could have just said, this is the hope that I have. And I think it's, it's a needed reminder for us of the importance of sharing the source of the hope that we have, not just in our actions, that's so important, but, but holistically with our words as well, all of life sharing the hope that we have in Jesus. Now, I, I think for many of us, we're quite comfortable living out the gospel. Like just embodying it and showing up, caring, loving those around us, but actually putting to words who Jesus is can feel incredibly intimidating. And I think for some of us, the, the limitations we have is that we just see that as, well, that's for the evangelists, those who are gifted in that way, and, and those are the spiritual elite, so they can take care of that piece of it. Some of us just don't even know, how would I even share with someone should the opportunity present itself? What would I even say? Because sharing our faith can feel really intimidating, especially when you don't know how it's going to be received on the other end. But this morning, 
as we, we look at this passage, we're going to discover the importance of seeking those open opportunities, those moments that we can lean into and step into. But we're also going to discover that it's a lot easier to pay attention to those moments and to enter into those moments when we know our own story, and more importantly, when we know who our story is centered on. And so turn with me to Acts 20, 21. We're going to go to verse 37. I want to get a little bit of a running start here uh, before Paul kind of launches into his story. And I just want to set the scene one more time, just a reminder of where we're at as we're going through the book of Acts. Last week, we saw that Paul had showed up on the Temple Mount, one of the most sacred spaces, well, the most sacred space in the Jewish faith. And he had come there, and while he was there, he had been accused of a couple of things, teaching people against the Torah, the the written instructions of the Lord, but also that he was accused of bringing in a Gentile into the temple area, which was worthy of death. And so we last left off as the crowd, this mob in a frenzy, had come around Paul. They were beating him and striking him. He's bloodied and bruised. And as this small figure was crumpled in the center of this crowd, uh, a Roman tribune, the captain of the guard, was standing in the, the Antonia Fortress, which was just off the temple complex. And as word was coming through that there was this uprising happening, that something was happening on the Temple Mount, he sent his, his troops down and they surrounded Paul and they pulled his body out. They chain him between two soldiers and they're trying to get him out of there so fast that they actually carry him up the steps. He's just kind of being dragged along as he's going. And that's where we pick up this morning in verse 37. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, into the Antonia Fortress, He said to the tribune, may I I say something to you? I just, I want us just for a second to imagine this scene again. He's being raced up the steps, dragged along, carried along in chains. He sees the commander and he goes, hey, can I say something to you? Right? There's a mob behind that is waiting and wanting to see him put to death. And Paul's just in in this moment. Hey, can I just, can I say something to you? And what's so interesting is the next line in in the Tribune. And he said, do you you know Greek? Now we hear that and we think, oh, he's surprised that he can speak Greek. No, what's happening here is not that he knew Greek, not that Paul was speaking Greek. Because most everyone, that was the common language. Everyone could speak a little bit of Greek. They could get by with it. It it was the language that most everyone knew. Business was carried out in this. And so even people who were from far away knew just enough to get by. What was throwing him off was how fluently he spoke Greek. That this wasn't just anyone. No, this man was was a local. He knew the language well. And Claudius, that's the name of this tribune, this man who is in charge. He's looking at Paul and he says, verse 38, "Are are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? See, what was transpiring here was that there was a man from Egypt who had come into Jerusalem. He had gathered a bunch of followers. Claudius says here 4,000. Josephus, the, the early historian, he said there was about 30,000. What we know of Josephus is that he was, he was kind of prone to exaggerate. So we probably go more with Luke's number. It was a little more accurate. But this Egyptian had come and he was stirring up the people and he had this band of assassins with him. That word assassins in there, Skaroi. It comes from the name of the dagger people because they would carry a sakari, a curved blade underneath their robe, and they would come around and anyone that they deemed to be a sympathizer to Rome or a part of Rome itself, when the crowds were big enough, they would work their way through, stab someone, and then flee off. And so this Egyptian had 4,000 men at his command that were all coming in. And so Felix, the governor of the time, had pursued them uh, and, and drove them out into the desert and was able to, to squash this rebellion. But the Egyptian leader got away. And so all of a sudden, this ruckus is happening. And once again, at the Temple Mount, and people are all centering around Paul. And the tribune comes down and Claudius goes, I think I've got my man. I think I've got the Egyptian. This is going to be good for me. And then he's grabbing him and he's taking him away. And suddenly Paul's talking to him. And he's like, oh, no, this is, this is the wrong accent. This, this guy's from somewhere different. You are, you're not the Egyptian that I thought you were. Right? And Paul replies, no, I am a Jew. I'm from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. 
And so in the midst of this interchange, Paul, he's like, no, 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 I'm I'm not an Egyptian. I'm I'm a Jew from Tarsus. Paul, we see throughout his journey, is very proud of where he's from. He loves his homeland. He brings that out often. No, I'm from Tarsus. That's where I'm from. Now, what's interesting in this moment is that we also know that Paul is a Roman citizen, but he's not going to say anything of that right here. He's not going to press his rights or anything in this moment. No, he's talking to the tribune, and he's saying, no, I'm a Jew, I'm from Tarsus, and I beg you, permit me to speak to this people. Now, if you are the tribune in this moment, you're trying to figure out what is going on, because why would this guy want to address the people that were just trying to kill him? Why would this guy want to say anything? And so in this moment, he, he gives him permission. He says, and when he had given him permission, which is, pay attention to that. I think that's important for us. When he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. Again, Paul, a Roman citizen, doesn't claim this right. Dean Pinter, a theologian and pastor, he says, in an era where citizenship mattered significantly, where you were from mattered so much. Paul's understanding of citizenship and where one placed their ultimate allegiance continues to be important for Christians wherever they may happen to live. Because Paul's example is always to rightly order our allegiances. He is always about kingdom of heaven first, kingdom of Christ first. Then his citizenship, he, he still valued those. He still lived in those. He still identified as those. But they were always subservient to what he was about on kingdom mission. So in this moment, he's having a conversation with a Roman tribune. And he wants to speak to a Jewish people. So the last thing he is going to say in this moment is, oh, by the way, I'm a Roman citizen. Because those listening in that mob would be like, see, you're just like them. Right? This would be like showing up to a Biden rally wearing a Trump hat. You're not going to be listened to or vice versa. You're, you're not going to want to pay attention to each other. Paul knew his audience. And so he's not going to fight for that right because he still wants to be heard by the crew that's in front of him and the people that he has come uh, to proclaim the truth to. But there's also something else kind of hidden in here that I think is just a a helpful thing. It doesn't always translate. Not many of us are going to be brought before a violent mob, hopefully. Like, this is not going to be our life story here. Uh, But it's interesting to me that in the midst of this conversation, what does Paul ask for from the tribune? Permission. He understands the rank and order of what's happening in this moment, and he wants to be heard, and so he doesn't just fly past this person. No, he asks for permission. He's invited into the conversation. He he gives honor to this guy, and the guy says, okay, you can go ahead and speak. Now, I think this is important for us to pay attention to. And permission doesn't always mean, hey, can, can I share my story with you? Permission is when we have relationship with somebody and they invite us in and they want to hear the parts of us uh, that we want to share the entirety of who we are. But sometimes we can just run people over with our beliefs, can't we? Well, in the sake of sharing, I'm just going to give it to them all and hopefully they hear it. But in that process, we wonder, why didn't they fully hear me when I just talked over them and I never really listened to the questions that they had? or what the opportunity truly was before me. See, now what we're going to see in all of this, okay, just from the start, we're not going to look at a, a pattern of, of sharing our faith that's, that's guaranteed to be received, right? We're actually looking at an example where we're going to see like an uproar and a riot after Paul shares his story. So let's take some comfort from that because rejection is kind of a normal process of following Jesus, But I believe there's something for us in taking advantage of the moments when we are invited in, when we are given permission by those around us, when we are given permission by those we are in contact with, when we are given permission by our friends to take and seize that opportunity to share the hope that we have in Jesus. So Paul has this conversation. He now turns his attention to the the Jewish brothers and sisters in front of him. He's going to share his story. And what we're going to see is he's going to start with his common ground. I'm just like you. That's what we're going to see. Then he's going to share his Christ encounter. And then he's going to speak to his call. So let's pick back up then in verse 40. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when they, there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, 
Now, again, he's at the top of these steps. He turns and addresses them. Everyone gets quiet. He begins to speak in Hebrew, most likely Aramaic in this moment. And suddenly the people realize, oh, he's speaking to us. And so it gets real quiet. What an odd scene it must have been that these people that were clamoring for his death are now paying attention with kind of bated breath of like, okay, what's this guy going to say? And so Paul begins, brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And they became even more quiet. When they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, and he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus and Cilicia, brought, but brought up in the city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear witness from them. I received letters to the brothers and I journeyed towards Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. And so as Paul begins to share with them, as he's speaking to them, he has their attention. What's he doing in this moment? He's credentialing himself, but he's also identifying as one of them. He starts off making sure I'm a Jew, just as you are a Jew. I was born in Tarsus, but I was brought up in this very city in Jerusalem. I know the ways of this place. It's, it's where I cut my teeth. It's, it's where I, I, I observe the law. And more than that, I sat under Gamaliel, Rabban Gamaliel. Now, normally we think of a rabbi, not a rabban, but Gamaliel was so important, so known that he was considered Rabban, our master, the elder, a teacher to all. He was a man of significance. And this is who Paul had taught, been taught under. This is who he had emulated his life after. So he's got some street cred, Jew, raised in Jerusalem under this master teacher. He said, I was persecuting the way. When this way of Jesus came, when the gospel message was being made known, I went after it with more zeal than you can even imagine. I would be just like you at these steps clamoring for my death. I was under the authority of the high priest and the chief elders. They had given me written orders that I could, I could go to Damascus if I wanted to, and I could pull back those believers and bring them here to be punished. That's who I am. That's who I was. And he walks through the common ground, building a bridge, letting them know that he's just as they are now. See, Paul knew and his zealousness and the way that his life was before he encountered Christ, he very much would have been a part of that mob that was now at his feet. Most likely he would have been leading that mob with all of his zealousness. So what's the change? What's the difference? And that's what he's going to walk them through. What shifted? What turned his life upside down? Verse 6. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus. Now again, why was he going to Damascus? to continue pursuing and persecuting those who followed in the way of Jesus. That was his sole mission, that he was going to drag them back, that they could be punished. And about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, who you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And so Paul begins to describe the change that occurred. The one who is going to persecute now meets the very one that he was persecuting and he flips everything on its head. When Jesus encounters Paul, that light shines. Those around him are like, what is going on? Paul is blinded by the brightness of the light. And at this point, everything changes for him. The very one he was persecuting would now become his Lord. And the, the very one who thought he could see so well was led away blind to Damascus. And that's where he would truly learn to see. So now I'm sure as Paul was sharing all of this, this crowd and their hushed tones were starting to murmur a little bit. Because now Jesus has made his way into the picture and they're getting a little uncomfortable. 
Like, really, what's this about? Really, what, what are you talking about here? But Paul is saying here, my entire way of life was just as yours. And it was completely upended in a moment for Jesus. And that's why I'm here before you today. Verse 12. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there. What's Paul doing again here? He's, he's credentialing Ananias. He's like, Ananias, also a Jew, well spoken of by all the Jews in the area. He's a good guy. This is the one who came and met me. He came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and I saw him. The blindness now gone, he could truly see. Ananias, this devout man who was following in the way of Jesus, was now inviting Paul into the same uh, relationship with Jesus. And Ananias said in verse 14, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will to see the righteous one, to see Jesus, and to hear a voice from his mouth, for you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. Now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. See, each step, Paul is unveiling how he was moved to Jesus, brought to a relationship with Jesus. And I love Ananias' words. It's such a simple proclamation of the gospel when he says, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. I can almost hear him singing it of, rise, be baptized, sanitized, and new in Christ. Like you just, you want to feel it in that moment. He's like, Paul, let's go. But what's on display in this moment, what Paul is making so clear is that Jesus was calling. Jesus was changing everything. That Jesus was now at the center of Paul's story. And what he's drawing out and spelling out, he's like, brothers and sisters, you are me and I am you. And by God's grace and by the work of Jesus, I now have life in him and you can have that same life in him. And so Paul walks through this common ground. He, he talks through his encounter with Christ, and now he's going to move on to his, his ministry call, how Jesus is going to use him. Picking back up in verse 17. It says, when I had returned to Jerusalem and I was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance. We see the same word used of Peter earlier in Acts when Peter has a vision from the Lord. But where do we notice that Paul is in this moment? He's back at the temple. Right? He's showing them, even when I first came to Jesus, I was still an observant Jew. I was showed up to the temple, and while he's there praying, he fell into a trance, and he saw him. He saw Jesus saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. So there's Paul. He's praying. He receives this word from Jesus. Jesus is saying, Paul, you need to get out of Jerusalem now. And why? Because they're not going to accept you. They're not going to accept your testimony about me. They're not going to be able to understand the change that has transformed you. But Paul, who's always willing to just like pick a fight with anyone, is like not having it even from Jesus. He's like, no, I don't think you understand Jesus. They'll hear from me, right? Verse 19, Paul continues and he says, I said, Lord, They themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. Again, what's Paul saying here? How is he identifying with this crowd? He's like, again, I was the zealous one. You guys knew what I was about. They're going to look at me, Lord, and they're going to be like, how did this guy totally change and start following in the way? He was the one that was fervently pursuing it. He's like, my story will be enough. And Jesus is like, no, Paul, you need to get out of there. They're not going to receive you. They're not going to hear you. And then he takes it a step further in verse 21. And he said to me, Jesus said to Paul, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And this is the moment where all the common ground that had been built, all the ways the story was coming together as Paul was proclaiming what Jesus had done in his life, this was the moment where he lost them with one sentence and really with just one word, Gentiles. 
once he mentions the Gentiles, that crowd before him was like, and we're out. We want no part of that. This is not for the others. And what's so hard for me in this, and what had to be so hard for Paul, is that he saw that the Hebrew scriptures, it was fulfilled in Jesus. Everything that was there, Jesus fulfilled. The call on the Hebrew people, on the people of Israel, was to be a light to the nations, that all the nations would gather because of them, that they would see God moving, that it was always invitational, that all people would come under the rule and reign of God. And Jesus has now made that possible. But for some reason, it had gotten so twisted up that they were like, no, 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 it's just us four, no more. Just the, the, the Jewish people, that's all we're going to keep it at. We, we're not going to deal with them. They're dirty. And so the second he mentions this, there's just this, this fervor and this anger. Verse 22, up to this word, they listened to him. They, then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air. I mean, they're so mad that they're just, they're, they're disrobing. They're like kicking up the dust. Like it's normal when someone feels like there's blasphemy. Do you rip your cloth? But this is different. This is just sheer anger. There's frustration. They're throwing down their cloaks. They're kicking up. They're just making kind of a ruckus of like, we want this guy dead. Can you just stop him from talking? We don't want to hear him anymore. And the reaction is strong and it's violent. A complete rejection to what they've just heard. And that mob rises again. Now, I know this is weird to say. It doesn't sound like this is a very encouraging story, but I do take encouragement from this. Because let's be honest, no one likes to be rejected. And if you do, there's probably some work for you to do there. No one likes to be disliked. No one likes to be the center of why people are angry all the time. But here's, here's what we know. Jesus was clear. He, he told his disciples, he tells us, if they rejected him, they'll reject us. If they rejected Paul, then we should not be surprised when people reject us. Now, we can hear that and kind of run a couple different directions, can't we? We can be like, so it doesn't matter, so I'm just going to bowl over everyone. I don't care if they don't like me. I'm going to tell them the truth, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to blast through them. And others of us hear that, and we're like, I'm just going to step back, and I'm just, I don't know, I'm going to give up. I'm not going to say anything. But here's what we see with, with Paul, that he continues to live truth. He continues to proclaim truth, but he never stops trying. He never retreats, and he never stops loving And I think this is so important because Paul preached with a posture of love even in the face of hate. He had a mob crying for his death. He looks over at the Roman Tribune. He's like, I really need to say something to them, right? I don't know about you, but I probably would have been like, let's get to the barracks as fast as we can. They're actually gaining on us, right? And Paul's like, no, no, I want to say something. This is, this is my life call to proclaim and to witness the things that I've seen and heard and I need more people to know Jesus even if they don't want to hear it. I just, I just want to proclaim it even in the face of rejection. My hope for us is that we would be a people that would continue with a posture of love even in the face of hate. But the question is how do we do that? How do we show up? How do we, how do we witness? How do we share what God has done in our life? I think it starts by remembering our story. And what do I mean by that? Well, I think we have to go back and we remember our common ground. We remember that all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short. All of us have failed. There is no one perfect person in this room. We've got a list of stories in here that we could share that we'd be ashamed of, that we'd be like, oh my goodness, I had no idea. And yet we gather in this place because we've experienced the forgiveness and the love of Christ and newness in him. And so we celebrate the beauty that's come from all of our shared brokenness. But the danger is, is that some of us, the longer we've been following Christ and the more he's sanctifying us and changing us, the more and more we start to go, yeah, I think I've got this figured out and I'm, I'm, I'm a lot better than those people. 
man, I don't understand how they think. I don't understand how they are. What is wrong with them? Because we forgot where we all started, that we all once were lost, that we all once were blind and could not see. But Christ and his graciousness transformed us. And so we, we have to go back. And I'm not saying live there, but I'm saying we have to remember so that when you're sitting across the table from somebody and you're frustrated with their, their line of thinking because it's so other than the way of Jesus, you have to remember, just as they were lost, so once was I. But look what the Lord did to me. Look what the Lord did to you. Imagine what he could do for them. And so we have to remember our common ground, that we've all sinned. But again, the other piece, we remember that. But we also need to remember our encounter with Christ. We need to remember when he rescued us, that moment when uh, if you've chosen to give your life over to him, that you're following him, you accept him as Lord and Savior, you need to remember the beauty of that moment. And my hope is that we never lose our wonder of that, that that never becomes rote, that when we think back to our rescue of what God has done in our life, that he took us from death and he brought us to life, that where once we were living in our shame, now we have forgiveness and freedom, that that never becomes old to share that it's always stirring within us, but we, we need to remember that. We need to rehearse that story, that by his name, by his name, we are saved. And then we need to remember our call, the call to go into all the world to be witnesses to the end of the earth. That's not just for some of us in this room. That's for all of us who call upon the name of Jesus that we now live a life as witness to the things that we've seen and we've heard in him. We are all compelled and propelled by the love we have received in Christ to proclaim the love and the truth of Christ. There's one author who says that uh, Jeff Vanderstelt, he talks around this idea that we are to, to live a life that demands a gospel explanation. And I love that. That our life looks so different that people are like, what is going on with you? And it becomes this open opportunity to share what Jesus has done in our life. But again, what do we see in this moment? The crowd hears Paul's story. He builds the common ground. He's coming after them with the good news of Jesus and they don't care. The mob lost their mind. Claudius, the tribune, he acts quickly. Verse 24, the tribune ordered him to be brought back into the barracks saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. Right, this is just like kind of subtly thrown in there. And when we read this story, we can read through it fast, kind of just skimming through the details. But can you imagine the whiplash that Paul is now experiencing? He's been beaten and bloodied. He's carried up the stairs. He's now sharing the good news of Jesus. And then as the crowd erupts again, the tribune's like, let's go and flog him so we can get to the bottom of this. Right? The next verse tells us that when they had stretched him out for the whips, they're preparing him because for the Romans, if you were a commoner, if you were a slave, if, you, if they weren't getting the information, well, then uh, pain was just the easy option to make you talk and to say what they needed to hear. And so they, they stretch him out for the whips. And Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, and again, I, I don't know Paul's tone of voice in this moment, but it's just a curious moment as he's stretched out, you know, he's still probably bleeding from his last beating and he's just hanging there and he's like, okay, well, here, here we go. And then he, he turns to the centurion and he's like, ah, is it, is it lawful for you to flog a man who's a Roman citizen and uncondemned? Right, like just ask the question. Doesn't demand anything, right? Strange that he's not like, don't you know who I am? No, he asks the question, invites the guy in, and the guy's like, oh, wait, you're a Roman citizen. And this sets off a chain of reactions. When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, what are you about to do for this man is a Roman citizen? The centurion knew the implications of this. If we, if we flog this man, if we injure this man, if we take him, he's, he's untried and he's, he's, un he's not condemned at this moment, like we, we're in trouble. This is going to reflect poorly on, on both of us. And so the tribune came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. And the tribune answered, confused by this moment, right? Because up until this moment, all he knew was that Saul was from Tarsus and really proud of that fact. And he's like, you're a Roman citizen? And then he, asked, he tells him, I, I bought this citizenship for a large sum of money. He's like looking at Paul like, how did you, how did you pull this off? 
Like I had to finagle my way into the Roman way of life. I had to pay a lot of money. Like how did you do this? And Paul said, but I'm, I'm a citizen by birth. See, this carried weight. In some circles, if you were a citizen by birth, you were seen as, as slightly superior to those who had to buy their way in. And so in this moment, this Roman tribune, he's trying Paul with, with no cause. He's about to beat him. He realizes, like, I could, I could lose everything if I proceed forward with this. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately, and the tribune was also afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. So Claudius now had to make sure that the way he was treating Paul was very different. And we'll see that Paul now enjoys the rights of a Roman citizen. It doesn't mean that he's going to be treated uh, splendidly over the next uh, few chapters that we read, but it's going to be uh, treated somewhat fairly in how he's presented. But we're also going to see that Claudius is still trying to figure out, okay, if I can't beat him to get to the truth, I need to get to the truth somehow. And so next week we'll see him bring in the Jewish council to try and pepper him with questions and figure out what is really going on here. But again, what I love about Paul and what we'll continue to hear from him over and over again, every opportunity he's given, what he'll speak to is the life change that Jesus has brought to his life. And for me, this is where I think we can all grab hold of the example of Paul. Paul was one to to so willingly share his story. Paul was one to never forget the common ground that he had with those around him. Paul was one to share the encounter with Christ that he had and also to to remember and share his call. It was not about his abilities. It was not about him. It was not about what he could do. That was never it with Paul. It was always about Jesus and his abilities and what Jesus had done. See, Paul lived a life that was compelled and propelled by the love he had received from Christ and in receiving that, now he lived to proclaim the truth and love of Christ. And Paul continues to live this life that demands gospel explanation. Now, we, we began by, by hearing a story of a man who had come to Christ and when he shared that with his boss, he just said, why, why didn't you ever tell me? Why didn't you ever tell me? But that conversation continued on. See, the the man looked at his boss and he said, actually, you're the very reason I have not been interested in the gospel all these years. Pretty stinging indictment in that moment. And the boss wondered, "How, how can that be? I've done my very best to live the Christian life around you. At that point, the employer, the employee said, that's the point. You lived such a model life without telling me that it was Christ who made the difference. I convinced myself that if you could live such a good and happy life without Christ, then I could too. Paul was always quick to make sure that Jesus was the center of the story. It wasn't that he was just, he was so disciplined. So disciplined. He's just a good person. He's a really smart, intellectual guy. No, that that wasn't what made the difference in Paul. It was Jesus through and through that made the difference in Paul. It's it's not just our, our good works that make us who we are. No, it's what Jesus has done and transformed in our lives. And so when we share our story, we have to point there. That we never, we never are without need of Jesus. No matter how far we have traveled with him, no matter how long we have followed Jesus, we always have need for Jesus every day, every minute, every second. And we need to proclaim that so that others aren't fooled. But like, no, I just have it all together because I'm awesome. No, I'm a train wreck, but thanks be to God that he rescued me. Thanks be to Jesus that he is exactly who he promises to be. So may we never fail to speak of the reason for our hope. May we never fail to speak of our need for Christ. And I believe there are open opportunities before us all the time. And again, it might not look like standing before an angry, violent mob, but it may simply be the conversations that we are invited into As someone just asks a question, sees something different in us, 
How do you have the hope that you have in a world that is so filled with fear, open opportunity to begin to share? You know, I once, I once was filled with fear too. Man, my anxiety through the roof. And let's be honest, for some of us, like, it's not like, oh, I've gotten, I've conquered my anxiety. It's like, no, my anxiety is still through the roof, but, but Jesus gets me through. That's how I function the way I function. That's how I live the way I live. And in my failure, I can still go back to him and, and be renewed in him. So for those of us who have entered into life with Jesus, if you have called upon his name and you are following after him, I would encourage you to remember, to rehearse and respond. And here's what I mean by that. Remember your common ground. When you are talking with others, remember your common ground that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we all need Jesus. So when you are faced with someone who is in desperate need of Jesus but has not recognized that truth, remember that God saved you. He could very well save them. Rehearse your Christ encounter. What I mean by this is that you tell that story, whether it's to your family, to your friends, to yourself in worship, that you just remember what Jesus has done for you, that that is a story that you are ready with at all times. And I, I've even found in my own life, I can go back to kind of the historical moment of when Christ first encountered me and pulled me in, and I was like, yes, I'm all in. But, but I've also, I, I kind of keep a running tally too now of what he presently is doing for me, what I'm currently conquering because of what he has done in my life, those things that he's still rounding out the edges of because I'm like, oh, I'm still here after all this time. Lord, I need you. Rehearse what he has done. Rehearse what Jesus has done in your life. And then respond to your call to always be ready to share the hope that you have in Christ. It's not optional. It's not for the spiritual elite. It's not for some of us. No, that's something we all get to participate in, to, to bear witness to the things that you've seen and you have heard. To live a life that is compelled and propelled by the love we have received in Christ that we can proclaim the truth and the love of Christ. And we can live in such a way that our lives uh, demand a gospel explanation. And for those of you in this room who have yet to step in to life with Christ, then let me remind you of the, the commonalities that we have, that we've all sinned and we've all missed it. That in this room, there's a, a, a storied history of brokenness and hurt and shame and decisions that people aren't proud of. Moments that we all wish we could have back. Moments where we've just lost meaning, wondering if it means anything at all. And then suddenly we encountered Christ and that's available for you to turn your eyes towards him, to trust that he truly is the hope of all humanity and that all who call on his name will have life in him. May you encounter Christ today. That is my prayer and my hope for all in this space and for all who are listening alone. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You pray with me. Father, we, we just pause to remember of our waywardness, our need of you, God, our needs still. But Lord, we rejoice that just as the, the father and the story of the prodigal son saw him coming on the horizon and ran towards him, that you've run towards us, that you run towards us still. You don't shrink back in horror, but through your son, Jesus, you have paved the way that we can have life in you. And so God, we just, we thank you. We thank you for that truth. And God, I pray that your spirit would, would speak to us and empower us and open our eyes to those, those moments of opportunity where we've been invited in to share the hope that we have in you. Would we not shrink back? But out of love, would we share the, the, the hope that we've experienced 
the life that we've experienced in you? Would we never be selfish with those stories of what you've done in our lives? God, would we not edit those stories to make ourselves uh, look better than we ever were? No, God, we, we need to recognize how lost we were without you. But God, we also understand just how found we are in you that now we can have peace and rest. For any in this room who have yet to call upon your name, Lord, would you just speak to them now? Would they know that you are available to them and all they have to do is turn towards you, repent, change direction, face towards you, accept the truth of who you are, that you are Lord over all, that you gave your life on our behalf, that in you we might be a new creation in you, co-heirs with you, Christ, for all eternity. Jesus, we love you, and we pray all these things in your name. Amen.